And we want to give organisations that own data some good motivations to open up data so that it can be more useful for others. So um, I'm going to start with just talking a bit about what open means. Open means that the data is for everyone, that you don't constrain access to those who have money, you don't constrain access to only people that you approve of, you don't constrain access based on what people intend to do with the data. Open data means that it's free, that anybody can use it for whatever purpose they want to do with it. So does that mean that everyone else benefits from the work that I do? Well, yes, it does mean that everyone else benefits from the work that you do, but you do too, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today, how that happens. So I'm going to be talking about three basic types of model that people use when they're opening up data. The freemium kind of model is basically that you have a free entry level of open data, and then you have a paid level um, of added value data that you actually charge for, and you use that money that you get from the added value data to subsidize opening up the free level of data. The cross-subsidy model is basically that you get some extra benefit from opening up your data. And the network effects model means that you collaborate with other people to get better data that you can use in better ways. Okay. So I'm going to talk about each of those in turn. And as I'm talking about it, I'm going to use this model. Are you familiar with this? General sort of laws? This is a business model canvas. It's a way of assessing the kind of business model that you, can, that you are putting together. Um, you think about what partners you have, what activities you're engaging in, what resources you have, and come up with some kind of value proposition which has some cost structure associated with it. You think about your customer relationships, the channels through which you reach customers and who those customers actually are, and then think about what the revenue streams are. So I'm just going to use this as a way of structuring the talk. Before I get into the open data business models, I'm going to have a bit of a talk about closed data business models and how they work. So when you are dealing with data in a closed data environment, then you view data as part of your value proposition. The fact that you have, that you can, um, the, the data itself is what you are serving to customers. And when you view data as your value proposition, obviously you have the customers that sell it, and the way in which you constrain, you get money out of those customers, is that you get licensing fees. The license um, grants the customer some uh, use of that data. And um, when you operate in a, when you see data in that way, then you want to constrain who can access that data because if you just and what they can do with it because if they can just do anything with it then you won't get as many customers who are actually paying for your data what people don't factor in when they operate in the often in the closed data world is the fact that if you have if you're selling data selling data licenses then you have costs and activities that, that Produce those costs associated with those activities. So you need to sell the data itself, you need to go out there and drum up custom for it. You also need to enforce the licenses and the constraints, the terms and conditions that you place on the use of the data. So you need to make sure that nobody else is using data in ways that you don't want them to. And if they do, you need to take them to court. So that means that you need to have salespeople that go around and sell your data. And you also need to employ lawyers so that you can um, make sure that your licenses are very rigid, so that they can be enforced, so that you're likely to win your arguments in court, and so that you can take people to court. So this is all extra activity, extra cost, that is associated with a closed data model. So this is one of the disadvantages of a closed data model. It's a costly activity. It has costs associated with it, simply because you're closing data. The other disadvantage of a closed data model is to do with demand and shifting demand. 
this is a basic kind of graph of a demand curve where you have price going up left, quantity going on the right, and the curve shows you how many, how much you're likely to sell at a given price. So this is the demand that you get, and the curve can be more or less curvy, it can be straight. We don't often don't know exactly what that curve looks like. But what you do as a business is you set a particular price, you know that you're going to get a particular quantity sold at that price, and obviously that um, gives you a certain amount of revenue. And your idea is you pitch your price at such a level that you maximize your revenue. What happens over time is that you can have shifts in a demand curve. So things can happen outside your control as a business, which causes people to be willing to pay less for your product. Okay? When that happens, we call it a shift in the demand curve. So here we have the green line and now it's a red line. And as you can see, then the revenue is decreased because the demand curve has shifted. So the shift in demand curve happens when things outside your control change the, the amount of demand that you have for your product. This is a big risk. If you look at what's happened to, in the kind of content web, the web that we look at as humans, um, it's changed everything in terms of dem the demand curve for certain kinds of content. It's hit, in fact, every content industry. It's hit music, film, book, news, encyclopedias. You see all of these industries that were built around restricting access to content have had their business models fundamentally undermined by the web. Well, the data web is going to change everything too. And it's in the process of changing everything too. And in a similar way to the way that the content industry has been hit by the web, it, the data industry is going to be hit by the web. Okay. So, um, you can avoid that risk as an organisation in two ways. You can sell data where you know that the demand isn't going to change, where you know that that demand curve isn't going to shift and hit your revenues. And that will usually be very high value data that nobody else could ever get. Or you can reorient your business. You can think of a new way in which to make money. And that's where our open data business models come in. So, talking first about freemium. In the freemium business model, then you segment your customers into two sets. There's everyone who can access your open data. And then there's the few who are willing to pay for some extra value from your closed data. And the idea is that by providing that data for everyone as open data, then you make it easy for people to move from the everyone category into the few category. You provide them with an easy on-ramp. They can start playing around with using the data, get to know it, understand where it, what its benefits are, start to incorporate it into their systems, and then you hit them with, well, actually, you have to pay if you want this extra bit. And this high-value closed data that you sell is less likely to be hit by those shifts in the demand curve that I talked about. So it's less risky. So some example businesses that use a freemium model are, um, for example, the open corporates. Open corporates, which is an incubator company here, um, they provide open company data using a dual license mechanism. What they do is they provide the data as open data under a share-alike license. A share-alike license means that anybody who takes that data and puts it together with other information that they've got to create something new also has to make that available as open data. Now, companies who want to use that data are 
and want to do so secretly and behind the scenes. They don't want to open up their data, aren't prepared to use a share alike, uh, aren't prepared, prepared to accept a share alike license because they don't want to open up their data. So there's an other option that is offered by open corporates, which is a closed license for the data, which enables organisations to buy the data from them and then do whatever they want with it, not to have to open it up. So that's one kind of freemium model. You have everyone is available, can get hold of the share alike data, but the few ha who, who want to do something private and secretive with it have to pay. Another example is geolytics. So with geolytics, then they, uh, they provide, uh, for example, have provided the uh, postcode level um, areas, so the boundaries for each postcode uh, available to, to a really nice degree. But they've um, only made it available at a particular point in time, which was a couple of months ago. As things change, that data will get out of date. So they are offering to uh, a paid product, which is something that you get uh, that, that will keep up to date. So they'll keep releasing it to people who are willing to pay. So then again, you've got the open data, which in this case is less, has less quality, lower quality than the high value data that people pay for. The other way in which you can do a kind of freemium model is to use, uh, to provide a better service to those people who are prepared to pay. So this is one of the things that Placer do. You can access their API of open data for free, but if you want to go over a certain rate of, of uh, hits on their API, then you have to start paying. So that divides the, their customer base into those that can just access it for free and those that will pay. And again, that easy on-ramp for people to start paying them. So that's how the freemium model works. The cross-subsidy model, which I'm now talking about, as you saw in the freemium model, you're still thinking about data as something to sell. Right? It's still something that people will buy. Well, in a cross-subsidy model, you stop thinking about data as something you sell. Instead, you think about it as a key resource that your organization has that it can deploy in different ways. And when we're talking about cross-subsidy, then we're thinking about uh, the challenge is to come up with a business model where you're deploying open data to assist with your value propositions, to assist with your customer relationships, and to assist in the channels that you have to your customers to give extra access to the things that uh, extra access to your customers. So some examples of this. One way in which you can use a cross-subsidy model is to use open data to increase demand for a service that you provide. Okay? Nobody can copy the service that you give because it's based on your expertise. So you can provide open data as a, as a teaser to help get, get consultancy type of income. So Placer, for example, use this. They get paid for customizations and, and products that are built over the top of the free open data that they provide. Okay? And providing the free open data gives them the advertising and obviously shows that they have knowledge that, that means that they can provide these, these good customizations over the top of their free data. You can also use open data simply as a way of raising brand awareness. So geolytics, the reason that they provide the open, one of the reasons they provide open data is to increase brand awareness of the kind of products and services that they offer. Um, so it gives them a good reputation, particularly amongst developers who are likely to want to use their staff to have that open data available. The Gazette's model is quite an interesting one. So London Gazette is, uh, is a product that comes out of National Archives, delivered by uh, the stationery office. Um, and the way that that business model works is that people pay to place notices in the Gazettes, and that's how they get their revenue, for paying to place notices in the Gazette. So the more useful the Gazette is, 
the more ways in which it can be used, the more people will want to put notices in the Gazette, it's the idea of it, the more people want to put notices in the Gazette, and therefore the more money and revenue they will get in. The other final kind of example of people using cross-subsidy with open data is to make customers happy. So a media company that we're talking to at the moment wants to open up some data to enable innovation to happen over the data that they have so that they can then take the various products that are developed as part of, fr from that data being available, from developers working with their data, bring them back into the company and then use them to make their customers happy, use them as services to their customers. Okay? So they, in some ways and they're outsourcing their R&D efforts, you know, they're making other people, developers in the community, do stuff with their data that they can then buy back and provide the services to their customers and make their customers happy. Final kind of area or category of business models I want to talk about around network effects and employing network effects. When we think about the way that data flows between organisations, we tend to think of having uh, owners of data who collect and maintain that data and then publish it. Some intermediaries that take that data, add value to it, provide services over the top of it, perhaps applications that, that do things that are, um, can be used easily by consumers. And then we have the end users who actually use those applications and services that are provided by the intermediaries. So this is the kind of uh, flow of data that we think happening. In the real world though, things are a lot more complicated. You get people who own data taking data from other uh, from other owners of data and doing stuff with it. You get those owners then communicating directly with end users, providing that data directly to end users, and the end users providing data directly back to them. You get intermediaries that build on top of other intermediaries' work and that then take data from end users and use that in order to give added value services. And often, intermediaries actually supplying services and data enhanced data back to the original data owner that they originally got the data from. Okay. So if you think about data flowing through a complex network of organisations like this, there are things that we can do that take advantage of that network in order to um, provide value to a particular company. So in example here, the more data or the more valuable data that this owner opens up, the better the data that this intermediary has, the better the data that this intermediary has, which means that the service that the owner gets back is actually better. It works because of the network. So we start to think about these data models, think about how open data can be used to give you better, to enhance your activities, to lower your costs, and to help you to work with the key partners that you have as an organisation. And the best way of doing this in a networked environment is to collaborate with other partners, other contributors who can provide value to your data set. So in this way then you can distribute the, uh, the effort that is involved in, maintain, in collecting information and in maintaining information. That means that you have reduced cost. It also means because you've got better data quality from other people's uh, um, uh, contributions, it means that you have more informed activities going on within your organisation. The hoster of, in this kind of collaborative model, the hoster of the data gets two kinds of benefits. First of all, they get the improved data to use themselves, but also they benefit from being able to direct the activity of the community. They are the ultimate arbiter about what goes into the data and who is able to contribute towards it. So you get some benefits from actually hosting it yourself. And there are examples of this that work uh, uh, currently. So Music Brains, which is a catalogue of information about music, artists, albums and so on, is developed through a collaborative activity. So is OpenStreetMap. 
And so this legislation governing care, which is a project that I worked on, where we have contributors helping to enhance the value of the data that we use as part of the business. The important thing about these business models is that you don't have to just use one. You can use multiple of them, many of them together in harmony. In thinking about how you mix them up, you have to kind of partition your data into two sorts. There's, there's primary data that you go out of your way to collect because it is part, it's important for your organization. It takes effort to collect it and to maintain it, and it takes investment in people and equipment in order to do so. So examples of Met Office gathering data about weather, or book publishers who have to go out and get content from their authors, or the census, which, you know, lots of having to go out and actually get that information from people it takes a lot of people and equipment. There's also data that is what we call exhaust data. This is data that just arises kind of naturally out of the activity that you are currently doing just because you are needing to do that activity as, as part of your general work. So there's no extra effort or extra cost involved in creating that data set. And examples are things like till receipts or phone usage data or customer data or accounting data. In fact, a lot of data that you have um, that, you, that you kind of generally don't think of as data that you can do something with comes as exhaust data. So when you think about combining and using these models, then you should think about what kind of data you have. Different data suits different models. Is it primary data or is it exhaust data? Who else is involved in the network of people that consume this data and do stuff with it? And also, what's the quality like? If you have bad quality data that you want to improve, actually a collaborative mechanism for improving that data is a really nice way of doing it. And as I say, the different models can combine. You can collaborate on shared open data, which is then used to underpin services that you offer and you get paid for. And you can collaborate in order to reduce your costs, right, and in order to inform better activities, um, which you then use to, to underpin services that you offer that you get paid for. And you can offer it as an on-ramp onto uh, a closed data added value level as in a freemium model. The same data can be used in all those different ways, providing you revenue in those different ways. So that's it. This has been a kind of summary of a guide that we have up um, it's on Crocodile so that you can comment on it and it would be great if you would go and look at that and comment on it afterwards but for now